Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 611 of the podcast and it's Tuesday the 15th of March 2022 as I record this. This is a futurist in between episode, an interview with Elle Griffin who is using Substack and NFTs and blockchain platforms to publish her words in different ways. She also is questioning what's going on with publishing. Her Substack About page says after she finished her novel, she discovered that, quote, no one reads books and traditional publishing isn't really working for authors. She says on the page, of the 2.6 million books published in 2020, only 268 sold more than 100,000 copies. The vast majority, 96%, sold less than 1,000 copies. If most books have only 1,000 fans, then charging $10 every three to five years when a new book comes out is not the right way to monetize them. That's why I started this newsletter. And that's why I wanted to talk to Elle. (laughs) She is an author and a writer and a journalist, but she's also questioning the way things have always been done and she's doing them differently. She's also not embedded in the indie author community and she thinks differently to most of us too, which is refreshing because, and I've been thinking about this, the traditional publishing has set ways of doing things and indies used to be thinking out of the box and things and now we're getting a little bit set in our ways too. So it's very good to be challenged in different ways by someone from outside the community. So I hope you'll enjoy our discussion and hopefully find it challenging as well. There are some great questions to consider around your writing and your definition of success. Thanks to my patrons who sponsor these futurist episodes. And if you find them useful, you can support the show at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the creative pen. And you'll get the monthly Q&A audio and all the backlist. If you don't want to commit to a monthly payment, you can also buy me a coffee or two at buymeacoffee.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Elle Griffin is an author, editor, freelance journalist and creative entrepreneur using new methods of publishing to reach readers and make multiple streams of income with her work. So welcome, Elle. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm excited to talk to you today. But before we get into the more of the technology, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing. Yeah, so I've been a writer for a really long time, but I actually started my career in the content marketing side of things and then moved my way over to editorial. Now I've been an editorial journalist for a number of years. And while I was working on that on the side, I wanted to write a novel. So I wrote a book, it's a gothic novel called Obscurity. And when I finished it, I did all the normal things first. I sent it out to agents and was thinking maybe that would be a good idea, but As I was doing that, I was researching publishing as my own kind of like a journalist would, (laughs) like like researching the industry, trying to figure out how my book could best be successful. And that's when I decided to, that my book was not, not a mass appeal kind of book. It was not going to have a hundred thousand followers or buys purchases. So I decided that it would be better off for a couple thousand people that would really love it. And if that was the case, I was interested in doing that as part of the creator economy, which is kind of a newer, newer idea where the idea is like the author or writer gets paid like a a monthly people subscribe to that author monthly, as opposed to a let's pay this author $10 every time, every five years when they have a book come out, the idea is you subscribe to an author ongoing and they provide sort of behind the scenes access and things kind of as you're going very similar to your strategy because I know you have a blog and a podcast on the side of writing fiction so that's what Mm. I've been doing started a newsletter on Substack about a year ago which has kind of explored all of this and has been a very interesting experiment (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> Indeed. Well, and I want to start with the Substack experience because one of the oh. reasons I wanted to talk to you is I've had so many authors ask me about Substack. Now, of course, when I started doing this, I started writing in 2006. They were, it, it wasn't around, but I grew an email list as one does. And I've always kind of felt like, well, Substack's just an email list that that someone else manages for you. So I've been like, okay, I've got to ask someone. So let's start with the fiction and we'll get back into the nonfiction. So yeah. you serialized obscurity mm-hmm. on Substack. What are your tips for authors who want to use Substack for fiction in particular? When I first started serializing on Substack, I pitched the idea to my readers. I said, look, okay, publishing doesn't work. Here's all the reasons why. What if we bring serialized fiction back in the form of a Substack newsletter? I'll send out a new chapter of my novel every single week. You can subscribe to it for $10 a month or $50 a year and get the whole book. For an added tier, you can pay $200 and get access to the hardcover, very first edition of the book when it comes out. And that article just went insanely viral. Uh, At the time I wrote that article, I had done a lot of research on Substack and basically everyone was doing nonfiction there. I mean, you're not wrong. Substack Substack is pretty new and it only really, really started becoming kind of reaching mass appeal in the last two years when they got funding and started investing in it a lot. So it's fairly new, but it's picked up steam really quickly. And that article just saw, I mean, it saw 60,000 views in one day. The sub, the One of the co-founders of Substack reached out to me and was like, we want Substack to be a place for fiction. We love your idea. All of these fiction writers started following me at that time and were like, whoa, like this is such a great idea. My books have been published on Amazon and nothing's been happening to them at all. So this is such a cool idea. I'm going to try this too. And what started out when I wrote that post, there was, I think three or four fiction writers on Substack and I was one of them. And then it just exploded from there. I think there are hundreds, if not thousands now. Um, And because of that, Substack added the fiction category to their website. They ended up hiring another person to help recruit fiction writers to the platform. That's how they got Salman Rushdie to join and some of these really big authors to join. So it just kind of started this crazy movement. And now I think it's very fascinating because there are all these writers you can find and follow on Substack. You can read their fiction, a new chapter each week or however often they publish. And because Substack is has this community element built in, you can comment on each other's work and then comments kind of lead back to your work. So everybody's networking through it. It's It's been really fun. I, I think it's a great idea personally. <laughs> It's so funny because exa- what you just said there, you can comment and it leads people back to your work. That's exactly what we did in the early days of blogging. Yeah, yeah yep. it was like, go on, on people's blogs, leave comments, and that will bring well, bring traffic to your work and link backs and all this. And then what happened was kind of that changed and people moved more. Like all, I used to get a lot more comments and then people started commenting on social media. So those c- comments went away. But what you're talking about there, it just sounds like essentially the Substack is like a serialized blog. Yes. Yeah. It's very similar to blogging in the odds. I had a blog then too, and it was very similar. And then, yeah, you're right. We lost that. And all those comments went to social media, but Substack and Substack, I wish I could tell you all of the things they're building because I'm a beta tester for them now. And the (laughs) things that they've got, it's just down the pipeline. It's like every writer's dream, but it's exactly that. It's, it's allowing writers to network with each other and find each other and follow each other. And Now, when I write an article on Substack, I get hundreds and hundreds of comments. And that never used to happen when I used to just have a blog or like, I think between I, between when I had a WordPress blog and Substack, I had a a MailChimp newsletter or like a tiny letter newsletter. And those, I mean, I have barely interactions, any interactions. So Mm. the engagement is really beefed up there. That's so interesting. You've you've just changed my view now because I was thinking Substack was just like an email list. But no. what you're saying, it's more like a blog with an RSS feed through email. So, and I get your articles by email, but essentially they're coming from your Substack blog. So I need to think um, about a much bigger ecosystem, I think. Yeah. So if you go to lgriffin.substack.com, you can see all my newsletters, quote unquote, it's like mixing a WordPress blog 
with a newsletter, like a MailChimp newsletter with a social media, only you can do it all in one place. And as the writer, all I have to do is write and click send. So mm. it's, very, it's very cool. It's like building yeah. it all. That is, and does it include podcasting as well or video or any other media or is it writing focus? Yes. So you can have your podcast on, on your sub stack and it, you can also push that out to Spotify and anywhere else, but it can, a lot of people have sub stacks and you or Substack podcasts and you can just follow their podcasts. The interesting thing with Substack too is a lot of newsletters will charge you for like I'd have to pay $30 a month or something to send a newsletter, but Substack is completely free. But I can charge my readers to subscribe to higher tiered content. So a lot of writers will write a free newsletter and then say pay to subscribe to also get the podcast. And then Substack just takes 10% of that. Mm. So it's really nice because you can do podcasting and I, they just announced they're going to do video as well. So now you'll be able to just get all of it. I know I'm asking a lot of what might seem basic questions, but how does it match with Patreon then or Patreon as Americans say? Because I use uh, Patreon for my podcast and for you know some extra content. And that is, as you talked about at the beginning, a sort of subscription, creator economy, monthly income from people, wonderful people listening who support the show. So how is Substack different to Patreon? So they're very similar. I actually got both a Patreon and a Substack when I first started because I wanted to test both out and just see what the feature differences were. And basically what I determined was that Patreon is great in a lot of ways, but Substack is very specific for writers. Um, Whereas Patreon's kind of like for everyone, writers, musicians, and game makers, like anything you can think of can live on Patreon. There were a lot of like little things that I just felt weren't ideal for writing. Like for example, my Substack um, lives on this website that I have, like is hosted on Substack. And so people get there from Google. I get a lot of people from Google. I get a lot of people from just, I mean, everywhere, because people can share the article as if it's like an article on a news website, you know? Mm. So there, I just felt like there was a lot of, it, it was a little bit more ideal for writers in terms of sharing content more widely. You don't like, you don't go to Patreon's website and browse around trying to look for Patreons to follow. You have to be like, following somebody on some social media platform. And then they tell you, come look, check out my Patreon. Because otherwise, like, how would you get there? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Whereas Substack, you can browse around and look for all the other Substacks and you're there because you want to read writers and find writers to follow. The benefit that Patreon has over Substack is they allow you to have multiple pricing tiers. So Substack just allows you to have two. You can have a monthly and then a monthly and annual, and then a like a founding member tier, which is like the higher level tier. Okay. So I see there Substack has better SEO search engine optimization. So better discoverability for words. So that that's great. Let's talk about the nonfiction essays, or we could call them blog posts or articles that you have. So how has that gone? And what have you learned from a year of Substack? and, And how is the income, I guess, fitting into your business? So it's interesting, because when I initially started, I announced that I was going to write my newsletter for free, which my newsletter is just nonfiction. It's basically me documenting my journey of getting published. And then I was going to charge, if you want to join to read my book, then you can pay $10 a month or $50 a year. But what I found after a year, and I'm halfway through serializing my book now, I sent out a survey to everyone that was my paid subscribers, just asking how they were liking it and everything. And Not a single one of them subscribed because they wanted to read my book. And every single one of them had subscribed because they wanted to support my newsletter. (laughs) Uh, So I decided to change tactics and I decided, okay, I'm going to start charging for some of the things I offer on my newsletter and allow my fiction to be free. And so far that has gone a lot better. I think people are very used to getting fiction for free. And even when, even some of the case studies I relied on early on, like, Um, Alexander Dumas, who serialized The Count of Monte Cristo in a newspaper, like people weren't, people were paying to subscribe to the newsletter, but they weren't paying to subscribe to The Count of Monte Cristo. Like that was just part of the newspaper. So 
I just figured I might as well start trying to think about it like that, where the fiction is not necessarily how I'm making money. The nonfiction is and is more easily monetizable, but the fiction is available to like anyone who wants to read it. And I think you take a very similar approach. It seems like you're monetized through all of your nonfiction work and that supports your fiction work. Is that true? Uh, I'd say it's probably at this point about 25%. I mean, I make a pretty good income as a fiction writer as well. I make uh, a lot more than most fiction writers, but then I've got, I don't know, 20 books or something now as as a fiction writer. So, and I've been doing fiction for over a decade as well. So I definitely have almost two separate businesses, but I don't use any serialization with my books at right. all that's to do with long-running series with yeah. box sets with different formats a lot of different sites and also I think it's like you said people might not be so used to reading serialized fiction on subset I mean I wonder how Salman Rushdie's doing <laughs> but- right. oh. Yeah, what great it looks like. <laughs> no, exactly. But I bet you they paid him some money up front for that. It's not like he has to rely on the subscription. He would have got paid up front. But I mean, people who want serialized fiction are going to sites like Radish or Kindle Vella or other places, yeah. Wattpads, places like that. So I can see how it's difficult to do that on Substack. So let's just come to one of the articles you wrote recently. (laughs) You said, do I even want to write another book or should I write something that will get read instead, which I loved? Can you talk a bit about that? (laughs) Yeah. So, well, I have limited time. I have a day job in journalism and I've been writing my book on the side of my job for three years and then I published it this year. And then what was so crazy to me is as I published my book and I've had like maybe 46 people actually read through to the current chapter and I have 4,200 newsletter subscribers. <laughs> so I just thought this is so funny. Like here I wrote this thing that took three years of my life, like that I worked so hard on and that I personally love that feels like a, a personal masterpiece for me, but it's just not like read and enjoyed the way that I would love it to be. But my newsletter is just by accident. And it's so strange to me because my newsletter is so easy for me to write. It almost just feels like my own journal. It's like me having all my thoughts about publishing my book and just about being a novelist and exploring different avenues. And so I was just like, okay, if I, if, do I want to spend the next three years of my life writing a book that's going to get 46 viewers <laughs> or should it, would it be a better use of my time to continue working on my newsletter? And maybe one day, you know, maybe one day I'll have 20,000 newsletter subscribers and I'll feel pretty great about that. And maybe that'll be even earning me a living. And then I can work on my next book and put it out there and it'll have a better chance of success. And I won't, I won't need to like rely on it for any kind of income. So you're essentially what you're saying is you still do want to write books, but you want to build an audience first and a a business first and um, then potentially write other things (laughs) that, that, that you can put out for free or you can make some money on, but they don't have to support you, basically. Yeah, and I I. I mean, maybe it's a little bit masochist of me to say that I want to write another book because I, with all of the research I've done in the past year, I mean, I mean, even the fact that you're, I mean, you are super prolific, you're a super successful um, New York Times bestselling author. And the fact that those are only making up 25% of your income is just kind of, it's kind of proof, right? Like, <laughs> oh yeah, completely. <laughs> it's proof that like, okay, we're not just going to be novelists for a living. I mean, maybe you can't, maybe you could be. And like, there's probably a lot, and there are a couple people that are, but when I was doing my research, um, I looked up, I went through all the data for 2020. Like I was so excited to get access to the data from Bookstat. Paula Bossi was so gracious. He's the owner, gave me access to all of the 2020 data on book sales. And I was just weeding through that. And I was like, wait, only 200 books 267 books sold more than a hundred thousand copies in 2020. And I was like 200 some books of the 2.7 million published and a hundred thousand copies is not very much. If you think about how many people view a video on Netflix or on TikTok, like, and people spend three hours a day on video content and only 15 minutes a day on written content. So I was just like, this is kind of 
a little bit masochist of me to even want to write another book. Like what's wrong with me? <laughs> well, sometimes the, the so, medium. <laughs> I think sometimes the muse will not be denied. And those of us who are drawn to write stories, we can't stop that. And I do think for most writers, it isn't about the money. And most writers do have a day job. And I mean, I could say for me at this point, the nonfiction is a day job. But I do want to just to come back on those sales a lot of the six and seven figure authors, fiction authors I know, they are in Kindle Unlimited. And so pages read is more of a metric than sales. And of course, Paul does scrape data from Amazon, but I don't know how he integrates pages read. So I think that would potentially skew the sales because that 100,000 copies is, is presumably traditional publishing data. Yeah, it's traditional publishing audiobooks and everything on Amazon that's not Kindle Unlimited. So ah, okay. Sales. So that sales. changes the game. That definitely changes the game because as I said, a lot of people have got different income streams. And and again, I think these different income streams are so important uh, as we're talking about, but I do want to just mention another, because obviously I've, I'm one of your subscribers, so I get all your posts. Now, one of them was you sent a list of agents and you were, I don't know if you are now, querying agents. So even though you know all of this, are you still going to try and get a traditional publishing deal or is that something you've just given up on? I don't know because originally I was thinking, I, I don't know if I want to go the traditional route just because a lot of traditional publishers today don't put a lot of marketing behind the books that they purchase. And so when I've talked to a lot of authors that have done that, a lot of them had regrets like, okay, I was so excited to get an agent and then I was so excited to get a publisher and then I sold 2000 copies and they kept kept 75% of the profits and I can't even do anything else with it for 10 years until my contract runs out or whatever. And so they were like kind of hoping that it was going to, they were going to push it harder or get it into airports and get it everywhere. And so I'm a little bit leery. Um, that being said, I think that if you have a book, that's like a mass market play, like maybe that could be a good option. But again, the odds are so slim that you're going to be the success story that I almost feel like self-publishing would be better. And I actually want to know more about those Kindle Unlimited stats because I cannot get my hands on any. And I'm trying to understand that as well. Because like you said, there are plenty of people being very successful in there. But I have recently had a lot of agents that I actually queried like two years ago, start following my newsletter. And I'm like, what's <laughs> happening? Do I need to start pitching my books like in my newsletter? <laughs> I'm like, and so that has definitely made me start to think like, uh, is there another way to, maybe I should figure out like a way to play this. Publishers and agents want authors with a platform and you now have a platform. <laughs> <laughs> but because I now have a platform, I'd be better off selling to my list directly than through the publisher. Because yes, that is, a, that is the unfortunate truth. <laughs> <laughs> they just want to sell to my own audience. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. And also because, for example, I love the fact you've written some fiction, but I'm one of those people who's following you because I'm interested in your thoughts on publishing. Uh, yeah. I'm not. So if you put out a fiction book under this name, I probably won't buy it because I'm interested in the nonfiction stuff. And that's actually one of the reasons I started another pen name back in like 2014. I split my fiction under another name because I wanted to separate my audiences. So that's another interesting potential um, for you in the future I mean have you considered that I'm definitely thinking about that because I think for example my book is also on Wattpad and Royal Road and I almost think I would be better off putting my fiction on Wattpad and serializing it there where I'm known for my fiction and anybody who's following my Wattpad is following me for my fiction but you know I include include at the bottom of every chapter in Wattpad hey you can subscribe to my newsletter at lgriffin.substack.com because I do think eventually, not only are there people that follow me on Substack just for my newsletter, but I think there could be people that follow me for my fiction and want the behind the scenes access that I give in my newsletter. So I, I think of, I don't like want to split my brands, but maybe it's just split. There might be people that come in just for my fiction and there might be people that come in from my nonfiction and either way, I think my newsletter is kind of a, well, this is my, who I am. <laughs> yeah, who I am, exactly. I, from my experience, I uh, found an overlap of about 5%. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it is. But there you go. I mean, that everyone has a different situation. But let's talk about your novel, The Totally True Story of Scott Paul, which you crowdfunded through blockchain platform Mirror. Tell us about that. I think a lot of people listening will never have heard of this platform. And so tell us why you chose that and, and what were you doing with that? Yeah, so I've been really interested in the whole Web3 crypto NFT scene just because it has attracted the attention of this techie audience that is somewhat wealthy and are investing in art, basically. All these NFT debuts are are art, their graphic design, their hand illustration, and just money is pouring into these things. I mean, millions of dollars being spent on NFTs. And this is the first real investment we've seen in art for a long time, like maybe even since the Renaissance Um, you know, people will invest in fine art, maybe for their homes a little bit, but for whatever reason, I think because of its involvement in the tech crowd, like NFTs have just attracted this audience of people that are interested in art. And so I've been fascinated watching it. And then I've started to see these platforms pop up that are not just for graphic design, but for writers. Um, Mirror was kind of the first one and there's a couple more right now, but neither of them are quite as well followed as mirror mirror is so far. But the idea is interesting. You can basically write an article on the platform. When you publish it, it lives on the blockchain, although that's happening behind the scenes. As, As a reader, you're just reading the article. And then you can sell that as an NFT. And it's as easy as you just like press a button that says mint as NFT. And then you can choose the wallet address of the person you want to give it to. And then they have this crowdfunding feature that's a lot like Kickstarter, where you can just debut something and say, hey, crowdfund this project, and it's all via Ethereum. So it's like you're investing in a it's like you're investing in a Kickstarter, only you're not just making a donation to that person, you're investing in that person. You would get proceeds if the author does. So what I did was I debuted a crowdfund on Mirror and I said, I'm going to write a novel that takes place in the metaverse and I'm going to write a new chapter for every 0.25 ETH raised. So it was a serial novel and I just was kind of just a little experiment. I wrote a tiny little prologue and I put it out there and I wrote it specifically for the crypto tech audience, meaning that chapters were very, very short. They took place in the metaverse and involved a lot of the weird NFT stuff that goes on in the metaverse. The story was very weird. And (laughs) and then I ended up raising, it depends on the day, how much the ETH is worth, but it's like 0.75 ETH. So it's like two to $4,000. And I, I actually closed the crowdfund after that because I thought that the story was in a good place to end. So I didn't want to like keep it open and keep writing new chapters forever. So I decided to close the crowdfund at that point. And I wrote each story, minted it on Mirror, and then sold them to the people who invested. So now it's a finished story. And what I'm trying to do is sell it to animation studios because I think it would like make a good South Park episode, for instance. It's about the battle between Scott Paul as the main character, and it's about his battle with Mormonism in the metaverse. So <laughs> quirky and very much fits the vibe of a, of a South Park episode. So I was like, well, I'm going to try to sell it as um, an NFT to an animation studio. And if I sell it, then all the backers of the project will, they own a percentage of the pro- project. So they'll get percentage of the earnings. So it was a very interesting, I think it's kind of early. And I think there's, there was one other book that crowdfunded on Mirror, and that was a YA novel called Burn Alpha. And then there's been a couple other smaller projects that What I'm really interested in is some of the bigger platforms are about to get into NFTs. And I think there are some fascinating ideas that are going to happen and come out of that. Oh, I love this. And I've done a few shows on NFTs. (laughs) I feel like a lot of authors don't get it. Well, most authors don't get it. And most publishers don't get it either. And But I'm like you, I'm very excited about it. And what you basically did, there was a kind of royalty fractionalization. And if you do sell it to, uh, you know, animation or South Park or whatever, then as you said, the people who own those NFTs, they've kind of bought into your future. So 
it has that built-in marketing because people want you to be successful because then they are more successful themselves, which I I really like. But you mentioned their uh, bigger platforms. So what are you seeing? So I've been in talks with several platforms that are looking at some very awesome ideas. The one I'm most excited about is a way to monetize fan fiction. So the idea is Imagine you write a story and it's really good. And maybe like, let's say it's a vampire lore story um, and everybody wants to write fan fiction for it. Well, what you can do as the author is you can say here, I've minted the characters of my novel as an NFT. If you want to use them in your book, go right ahead. So then the fan fiction writers can buy those characters and use them in their own novels and even sell their own novels with the original author earning royalties on those characters because they're being used in another work. So it's this kind of way for the initial author to still get credit for the fan fiction. And I think that's really interesting because that's a lot of the reason why authors are against fan fiction is because they're like, well, then you're taking my work and then you're being really successful at it. And it's my work to start with. But if you could kind of build that into the process, that would be so cool. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. And I don't know if you saw the project, I can't remember the name of it now, but last year, so we're talking in in March 2022, and I think it was around November 2021, a group of YA authors put up this kind of thing, and they got absolutely slammed in social media, and they ended up taking it down. And I feel like people didn't understand what they were trying to do. They got accused of ripping their fans off and and all this type of thing. Do, Do you think the the understanding of this is is moving fast enough in the right direction? I think that it's hard because definitely if you're into NFTs as a writer, you're an early adopter. So so the re- your you can't think of your readers the same way. Like you can't think of the readers of an NFT project being the people who read like your fiction novels, for example. They're gonna be like a tech dominant kind of person that already knows about NFTs and crypto and is well-versed in that. So I think anytime you debut the idea and then share it with maybe a general public who isn't as knowledgeable about it, they might see it differently. I mean, a lot of people right now think about NFTs, like they'll, they'll call them MLMs or like they don't understand, like they don't, I think there's like a lack of understanding about how they actually work and how they benefit the original creator and the people that are investing. So, but I think as that starts to become more clear, that won't happen. Like that situation that happened, I think it needed a little bit more communication around it and what they were doing, but they also probably needed to target an audience that maybe better understood. And I Mm -hmm. think the audience is better understanding like every month. And eventually I think once we're tr- once we're just using Venmo and stuff to swap crypto back and forth, it'll be like a no brainer, something that we're not even really thinking about. It's just the fact that it exists in this kind of techie space where a lot of the platforms are kind of hard to use right now. That makes it hard to understand. It, it would kind of be like trying to get somebody to use the internet in like 1996, but nobody knows what the internet is. So you're trying to send an email with like MS DOS and it just seems really complicated. And you're like, why would I ever do this? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm glad you used that example because I've said this too to people. I'm like, look, you don't know how the internet works, but yeah. you use it. You don't know how PayPal works, but you send money that way. So I feel like people are almost annoyed because we're talking about something that is so early and they're expecting it to be exactly right at the moment. Whereas of course it took what, well, like you just said, like 25 years for us to get to this stage of the internet. I mean, I'm kind of thinking it's two to three years away until we really get a lot of more mainstream uses, or do you think that might have accelerated due to the pandemic? I know that there are a couple of platforms that are about to debut this in a big way that will make it more natural. So I think maybe You're right. Probably two to three years. Like once that stuff is all rolled out and it becomes so natural, you're not even thinking about it, then that's, it'll be normal. I mean, it kind of already is normal. If you think about like right now to use Wattpad, you have to buy coins and then you use coins to purchase, to unlock chapters of a book. That's kind of how crypto will work. Like you won't be thinking of it. Like it's just a coin or when you go to Disneyland, you can have Disney bucks or whatever. Like you change your you use different forms of currency for different things and you're like buying those with us dollars. So I think eventually that's how it'll be. And I think it's very, very close. One question though, you mentioned 1996. Now 
<laughs> I, I'm definitely older than you. And I was working, um, I actually was part of a Millennium Bug project <laughs> way back in, oh, I remember the Millennium Bug. But well, what happened to a lot of my friends who started, who a lot of them worked in companies that then got destroyed in the dot com when all, all of that crashed. So a lot of those companies didn't survive. And then companies like Amazon, for example, obviously made it through the crash into the mainstream. Now, a lot of people are calling NFTs a bubble right now. And of course, we've already had a drop in the value of some of the cryptocurrencies. And obviously, the world right now is difficult. But do you think we're heading for an NFT crash? Or do you think that it just is starting? Yes. I mean, I think that there are a lot of startups in this space right now. And there's going to be one or two of them that we're still using five years from now and the rest are going to be gone. So it's definitely like, there's a lot of players vying for this space and trying to make it something, but just like right now, we all use Venmo to transfer money back and forth to each other. That's kind of stuck around. I think there'll be eventually some like one or two things that we start using as part of our day-to-day lives, but most of it won't survive for sure. I mean, all of this right now is like a big playground or sandbox where we're testing out a lot of ideas and just seeing what works. And there's a lot of excitement around NFTs, but yeah, some of the NFT projects are totally stupid. And like, why would you buy them? And, and yeah, when the stock market crashes and nobody has jobs, are you really going to be happy that you have a picture of an ape on your phone? Like probably that's probably not going to make a big difference to you. But like, I think that the ultimate, what NFTs stand for as we start to figure out like what makes an NFT valuable, some of those things will stay. For example, the Board Ape Yacht Club is not a picture of an ape on a, your phone. It's like a $20,000 admission into a millionaire's club where if you have a business idea or you're a startup and you're trying to get investors, it's probably a good idea to buy a Board Ape so you can get into the Yacht Club and have access to those people who could invest in your business. So I think like determining what what will make an NFT valuable in the future. Once we figure that out, those will be the things that have staying power and the rest will kind of just go away. And then, yeah, so you are, I mean, you sound like a realist in that you've, you assess data and you're like, this isn't working. I'm going to do something else. And I'm kind of less emotionally attached to some of your projects. Yeah. But um, I feel like you're also adventurous in your tech. And many people listening are afraid. They are actually afraid that the current business model is going away. Everyone's still struggling with monetizing themselves on Kindle and Facebook, let alone this, all these new platforms. So how can people change their their attitude to look to the next decade with more excitement than fear. I know. I think that is so fascinating. I feel like this is especially true of writers and I'm not really sure why, because I I think it's because there's like a certain prestige to writing novels that if you're a writer at all, you grew up thinking like one day I want to write a book and that feels like kind of the pinnacle or apex of your career as a writer. But the book format has changed so much over the years. And it's kind of weird to me that we're still holding on to it today when it's like one of the re- least read mediums you can use in your toolbox. I mean, I if I think if I think about would Victor Hugo use TikTok to or would he use Twitter today? Absolutely. Like Victor Hugo is like a political scion. Like he would for sure be on Twitter every day. Would Alexander Dumas be using Substack? I definitely think he would be because he published his book as a serial in the newspaper. And back then people made fun of him and said like he wasn't the literary sort. He was just like a commercial fiction writer, like selling out for the money. Yet for some reason, the I think because the the book has retained some level of prestige, it's still what writers really want to strive for. But if you actually look about at where people are spending their time, they're just not spending their time reading a book on Kindle or reading a book from the library. And I read some stat recently that was like something about um, even if you buy a book, it's not a guarantee it's going to be read. A lot of people are aspirational book buyers, meaning they just buy them and put them on their shelf and like never read them. (laughs) And so it's just like, well, where will your writing be read then? Where will your writing have the best chance of being read? And right now I think that's Substack. I think it's medium to some extent. They're starting to be vocal. There's Wattpad, there's Railroad, there's Tapas and Radish. Go where the people are reading and then publish for that format. Like there's nothing wrong in 
making your novel a digital novel or publishing it as a serial or there's so many ways to publish your novel. Why not publish it in a way that will be successful? Brilliant. Well, I love your Substack. I think it's fantastic. So tell people where they can find you and everything you do online. Yep. It's just lgriffin.substack.com. Um, E-L-L-E-G-R-I-F-F-I-N.substack.com. All my stuff's there. Brilliant. Thanks so much for your time, Elle. That was great. Thank you so much. So I hope you found the interview with Elle interesting today and that it gave you some ideas for evaluating what works in your author business. And perhaps you might even consider a different platform like Substack or some of the blockchain writing platforms that are emerging, as well as some of the serialized fiction ones that Elle mentioned. So let me know what you think about this episode. You can comment on the show notes, tweet me at the creative pen or email me joanna at the creative pen.com. Next Monday, we're back to the normal show and on writing craft when I'll be talking to Nikesh Shukla about your story matters. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.